is episode 89 of Off Script with Trish Close, intimate interviews and fun conversations with interesting people. In front of my microphone today, I have Mark Enlow from Parkhurst Wine Cellars. I asked him his official title, and he says, I own that bad boy. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, you are owner. You are head honcho. You are bottle washer and... Trash taker outer. And all those things. All that stuff. So glamorous. Very glamorous stuff. I've heard that a lot, actually. The wine business, it seems... It seems glamorous, but it's not. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Um, who told me, I think it was Vince Vadreen from uh, Irvine and Roberts. He said, you want to get into the wine business, get really good at cleaning tanks. Probably true. Right? Yep. It depends on which aspect you enter the business. Sure. I entered in retail. So yes. I started with uh, cutting boxes open and putting price tags on bottles, which is super, There's all, super there. It's all the same, right? Mm-hmm. All the work, it's different work, but it's essentially all the same. A lot of grunt work. A lot of grunt work. And the production side's even heavier lifting. I mean, you get for sure just hoses and tanks and trash and garbage and chemicals. and Mm -hmm. so You have to really, really want it. You have to want it. Okay. That's what I tell my new reporters in this business, in journalism, because it's people think it's glamorous. It's not. It's so much work, and you're doing it all by yourself, and you're lifting gear and equipment. and That's a lot of work. Talking to people who are total a-holes most of the time not most of the time sometimes so it's a lot okay we're going to talk a lot about wine because it is your life true it's your life um you also brought a bottle with you and this is you bought it you brought it with you for a specific reason because we just did a wine dinner you just did a wine dinner i didn't do anything but sit there and (laughs) eat and drink um but you had this beautiful story about your label. And so you're going to tell that story. I'm so excited to hear it because okay. it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, where are you from originally, Mark Enlow? Born in California. California. And uh, kind of lived pretty much everywhere. Um, got a chance to live in Europe for a while in Hawaii and back east, went to school back east and uh, just kind of oh, lived all over the place. you've been all over the place. South America. So. Wow. Okay. Well, we're, we're going we to talk about that. Where in California are you from? I was born in Santa Monica, lived in the Valley for a while, and most recently uh, the Bay Area. Wow, the valley. The valley. Santa Monica is a beautiful place. It's cool. I didn't realize people were born there. Yeah, you know the hospital in General <laughs> Hospital? That's Santa Monica General. Shut up. That's the hospital I was you born You were in. born in General Hospital. I was born in General Hospital. No way. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay, how long did you live in Santa Monica? Oh, I don't know. I was really very small at the time. Okay, so probably you a few moved? Years. We moved a lot. I went to 17 different grade schools. Shut up. Yeah, so we moved Why'd a lot. Why'd you move so much? I don't know. What's wrong with your parents? Uh, it was just my mom for the first 10 years, and then she remarried. Okay. So then, And then we continued to move. So it went from two of us to three of us. Mom just got bored? They, I, I guess. Maybe a little antsy, a little itchy. Just yeah. Just wanted to find new things to do. My husband's mom is the same way. They moved around a lot just because she was like, I'm done with this place. Yeah. Let's go somewhere else. New, new places. Never, never back to any of the places we lived at before. It was always yeah. someplace new. 17 so. grade schools, meaning like, what grades are we talking? High school uh, to 12. two? Yeah. Seventeen from kindergarten to, to that's to too that's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Did you, you start... ever get mad at her? Oh, all the time when I was a little kid, and I said, uh, you know, you can't. I said, I know we're gone because I can't, you know, you can't fight City Hall. And she goes, No, it, your opinion counts. And it's like, No, we're still left. City Hall being mom yeah, is being City mom. Hall. Yep. Uh, you get really good though at making friends. Yeah, you do. You do. And adjusting. But, um, unfortunately, it doesn't allow you to to keep friends for a real long term. You know, I know people that have friends since, you know, the early grade school, stuff like that. I don't have that. I don't but, either. You know, I don't so. either. I have a few, but I don't keep in touch with them. I mean, they're, they're on my Facebook page. You know what I mean? They're yeah. Like my Facebook they're those friends. kinds of friends. Right. Yeah. Those people. Um, I am actually, you may be feeling the same way, super jealous of people who are like, yeah, we've been friends since high school. Yeah. And they're yeah. super, super close. Yeah. 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 I've never had that. Yeah. My girlfriend, that's her friends that are up here. Because um, she introduced me to the to the mm-hmm. Rogue Valley, uh, they're all friends from high school, so they all yeah. graduated together. Does that? Are you jealous of that? No, no. They're nice people. I like them a lot. Mm. So, but I mean that you don't have that. No, because I have other friends, and you know things. You know things come and go. Mm-hmm. People come and go sometimes, but. Uh, so seventeen. I can't. I almost can't even wrap my. I mean that means you went to a couple of schools in the same year. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. All right. Um, so it was just, you said it was just you and your mom for a while? Yeah, for uh, until I was 10. Until you were 10, then and she got she, remarried? Yeah, she got remarried. And then the moving still continued. Yeah, we still kind of did some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that because you moved around so much, you want to settle or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to do the complete opposite. Sure. Um, but 
you know, I still moved, wound up moving around a little bit until uh, my son came along. And um, then I kind of put in some time, stayed in one spot and had one job for like 10 years. And that was kind of cool. And, mm -hmm. But then, you know, itching just a little bit to move along and right. do, do the next thing. Well, you, you probably can't. It's in your system, moving. A little bit, a little bit. That's why I've enjoyed and felt very comfortable moving up here. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, I just feel very confident. When you move mm. around that much, I'm assuming you can't be a pack rat. You can't have a lot of stuff with you. It's expensive if you do. <laughs> this last move about broke me. Really? <laughs> oh, it was, it was the 26 foot truck and the whole nine yeah. yards. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, you can't cart a lot of stuff around. I look at all the things I had when I was younger and record collections and things like that, and I go, ah, oh, I know. I should have kept all that, but yeah. I didn't. So. I find I have a love hate relationship with moving. I love it because you do get to purge and clean out and yeah. completely start over. But oh my gosh, is it a pain? Well, the worst ones are when you're moving like only two miles. Yeah. Because then you take everything because you figure it's only two miles or so. I'll yeah. just throw it all in a box and you got all this junk that sits in your garage for about two years until you move again. You go, well, I haven't needed it for two years. So that's so true. Long, so. That's true. We, we recently moved probably like three, four years ago, maybe. And we were doing really good, um, except for the guest bedroom. There was more crap in that bedroom than I think in our entire house that was like hidden. It's my garage. Yeah. <laughs> it's stuff under the bed that you're like, oh, I'll there's get to it. there's those fifty real simple magazines that I haven't read in two years. There mm -hmm. they are. Yeah. You should throw them away. You should throw I mean, them away. Yeah, throw them away. Burn them to something. Okay, so where do you graduate high school then? Uh, I went to Palm Springs High. Palm Springs High. So you all this time you're moving around, is it all in California? No. Oh, no, okay. it was uh, it was Hawaii. We lived in. Um, oh wow! Uh, yeah, we lived a lot of places. What took you to Hawaii? Curious. Uh, my mom just had an itch to go. Itch to go. Yeah, her girlfriend wanted to go, and so they said, "Well, let's go to Hawaii," and pulled me out of school. That was one of those same year things. Mm -hmm. I went to school for a month and a half in Southern California, and then, mm -hmm. and then we went there. And so, uh, yeah, so after Hawaii, gosh, where else did we live? We've lived. I've lived in Massachusetts, New York. Um, All in grade school. All while you Pretty were Pretty much 18. all in grade school, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then I you know, graduated in Palm Springs and then um, lived there for a few years, then lived over in Orange County for a few years. Was mom a bit of a gypsy? No. No? No. Uh, no? Okay. She just, she's a pretty confident woman. Just wanted to do the things she wanted to do. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that. Is she still and we around? were young. Yeah. We, uh, you know, she's only 20 years older than I am. Okay. And uh, so she was still kind of a kid at heart and she had, took her kid and we just went and did things. That makes for a few sense. Years. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So. Does she still move around a lot? Not not much. Okay. <laughs> not that mobile. Slows you down. It right? Slows you down. Yeah. Age definitely slows yeah. you down. So where is she now? She's in Southern California, Concord. Awesome. Yeah. That's so great. I go down about every month now just to say hi and see what's going on. Good. Take her to a doctor's appointment or something like that. What was it like living in Hawaii? How old were you? Do you remember? I've lived there twice. Okay. So I lived on Oahu. Um, I lived in Oahu when I was a kid. So 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. And then I went back uh, to Kauai to live. Oh, it was the year of the Rodney King riots. When was that? 91? Something like that? Sounds good in, to me. Right in there. So uh, then we lived on Kauai for a while. Okay. And then until Hurricane Aniki hit. And then I took off and we lived in Florida with my dad. And then we went to New York because um, I went to culinary school. You went to culinary school? Yeah. How CIA. old were you then? 34, whenever that was. Okay. Like so you graduate Palm Springs Highway. Highway. Palm Springs High School. Mm -hmm. Do you know what you want to be when you grow up at this point? No. Okay. <laughs> no, I was doing graphic arts and printing and stuff like that for a friend, and then I started to do some drafting things, um, uh, architectural kind of drafting, just really light stuff, nothing crazy like construction mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, then I, I got exposed to, I came up to Northern California, work with my brothers in a beef jerky plant. That's different. Random. Yeah. But what beef jerky plant? Do we know it? it? Was, no, because it's gone. Okay. Because one of the big guys put us out of business. So, Typical. which happens. Um, but uh, it was a lot of fun, really enlightening. And because and I was near the wine country, I got kind of exposed to wines. Mm -hmm. And um, Did you say a friend or your... My who, brother's. Your brother. Yeah. Okay. I forgot to ask. This is actually one of my questions. Okay. Did you grow up with siblings? Do you have siblings? I have two stepbrothers. Stepbrothers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you guys get along? Uh, yeah, one just passed a couple months ago, but mm -hmm. the other one, yeah, get, gets along. He helped me build a tasting room, Aww. which is nice. Um, Have so, you seen the movie Step Brothers? Yeah, but Will it's been Ferrell? ages, and I got I got short term memory issues. So okay, if if you if for those listening who have seen it, the first time I watched it, incredibly disturbing. Like it makes you feel icky everywhere. <laughs> There's just something about. 
I don't know the characters. And then every time since I when I've watched it over and over mm -hmm. again, it gets funnier and funnier, funnier and funnier. And funnier. There's movies like that, yeah. So anyhow, I have to give it. I have to give it another shot. Especially because you I have, have a list brother. about this long that's got, you know. Oh, but I've same. known them since I was ten, so it doesn't feel like Step Brothers. We 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 talk every other day practically with oh, each other. I love so that. and then uh, yeah, and like I said, we we lost the older older brother. I'm sorry to hear ago, that. So, but, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. So. Um, was that a sudden thing? No, he's been. He had health issues all his mm -hmm. life. Just he had a, a really tragic accident where he cut his arm really badly, and mm -hmm. it just caused multiple health yeah. issues. It just plagued him for about sixty years, probably. So. I think if if it's anything that's sudden, or if you know it's coming, it doesn't make it any easier. Yeah, yeah. It just it just sucks all the way around. Yeah, all the way so around. So, how did your brother get into the beef jerky business? Um, well, we, my my mom and dad and I used to make beef jerky at home. Okay. And That's my dad, a thing. People yeah, it's a do thing. This. Yeah, it's yeah. a thing. So we, we, we had this methodology of doing it, and uh, it was always a big deal for my dad. And he'd go out and buy a commercial slicer so we could get it just right. And he, mm -hmm. we, he literally went out and got those, you know, the over and under ovens that they uh -huh. plug in, the old style. Uh -huh. uh, he literally went out and got two of those from the local charity place and plugged them into the garage so that we could make beef jerky in the garage. Okay. And I was like, okay. So he and my mom, <laughs> he and my mom split up. And uh, he went to North and stayed with my brothers for a while. And mm -hmm. so he said, why don't we start this thing as a family business? So then they, Beef jerky. they dragged me up there and we gave it a shot. Where would you get the meat from? A wholesaler uh, okay. in the Central Valley. Because the whole idea is you're pulling all of the moisture out yeah. of the meat. And that's what makes it jerky. Right. Okay. We do that, but there's a, you know, there's a, there's a fine line going too far because then it turns to sawdust. So oh. you don't want to use a too fat a meat, so we used all bull. Really? Yeah, we used all bull, and we, we used all top round because that was the cut that was the leanest and had the right shape. Okay, so it has to be lean. Lean. Okay. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Paul Murdoch, who is with Gary West Meats, we've talked about beef jerky over the years and elk and all these different kinds of cuts yeah. and, and what works really, really well. Um, I had a viewer once, a super creepy viewer. He was very sweet, but... He would call all the time. He would drop off turkey jerky for me and my co-anchor. That's kind. No. It's just <laughs> it's gross. It's just weird. I mean, bless his heart, but it went right in the trash. Like, and it just... I don't care for salmon jerky either. That's one of those things. Yeah. yeah it just, just like, no. It's kind of weird. It's Anywho, leather. so who put you out of business? Oh, one of the big jerky companies uh -huh. that was distributed by uh, a large grocery distribution company. Dang it. And... Uh, they bought up our entire production for a month, and then they held it for two months and let it dry out, and then they gave it back to us. Oh, that's messed up. Yeah, it was messed up. That's business, though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, when was this? That was uh, around 1980, and then uh, I went south and went back to Orange County. Mm -hmm. So I guess I did go back a couple times. Yes. Um, and I went, got in the wine business. In the what business? In the wine business. Wine business. This yeah. is when it started, the 80s? Yeah, for me. Okay. 1980. I was 20. Correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like the 80s is when this kind of starts to get. Yeah, California wine was really hitting yeah. a stride. And, uh, I mean, we used to talk to – I talked to Robert, Robert Parker, who's a huge, you know, wine advocate and all that stuff. I used to talk to him directly on the telephone. It's no big deal. Call his office. Mm -hmm. And he was still practicing law at the time. Uh -huh. And them and um, – you just had one-on-one -on -one relationships. I mean, the buyers used to go up to Northern California all the time. It just seems like talking with a lot of you guys who are in the wine business, the 80s were when people, especially in restaurants, the sommeliers were starting to get big. People were really wanting a good bottle with dinner. It just right. sort of it became this this thing in the Well, 80s. you had a lot of, lot of brands that came uh, into the market then that are huge. Okay. Silver Oak, Jordan. Uh, Kendall Jackson, mm. um, Glen Ellen, mm -hmm. a lot of these brands that, that really hit their stride in well, 1980, 81, 82, 83, and they'd mm -hmm. started in the mid 70s, late 70s. Okay. So that's when they were really coming on the market. So it was a very cool time because you got to do and you got to do a lot of things in the industry with people who are considered the greats now. You know, I've, I've had lunch with a lot of these people and been exposed to a lot of that. Like who? Uh, Michael Broadbent. He's a pretty famous wine guy from. He's an MW master of wine from England. So I um, had a chance to have lunch with him. We had 1975 Bordeaux. We had 10 of them each and a bunch of them. I mean, you, you do that. That's what it was like back then. We had these right. huge auctions where we'd go to like the Hublin auction and mm -hmm. taste wine that was in Napoleon cellar. I mean, it's just insane. Shut up. Every, every, every BV reserve cab from 1953 up to 
what I had at the time, which was probably 78. I've tasted every single one of those in one setting. Really? Yeah. That's a lot. It's a lot. Do you spit or swallow? I uh, spit okay. most of the time. Uh, Unless it's really good. You've had, right. Then you... <laughs> yeah. You've had wine from Napoleon Cellar? Yeah, they had it there at the auction. It was kind of cool. You tasted it? I'm trying to remember whether I tasted it. I remember I was in line for it, but one of the bottles mm. broke because that guy had the gas charger thing where you go like that. He, yeah. he hit it in the bottom of the bottle. It just well, exploded. it is old. So, yeah, it is old. Old so, bottle. Fragile. Yeah. I've always been curious. Um, some of these wines like that are you know $8,000 on a wine list, like what do they taste like? I'm just curious because I'm never going to be able to afford a wine like that. I don't know. I, you know, I think there's a point of subjectivity and just, you know, it's, it's just a rare item. Mm-hmm. That's all. Is, is, is there really that much difference between a 59 Chateau Latour and a 59 Lafitte? Well, there is. You taste them side by side, but, but, on, but on their own, they're probably both exceptional. Okay. So. Okay. So you get into wine in mm-hmm. the 80s. Do you get hooked? Oh, yeah. Okay. Totally hooked. I mean, are you, from then to where we are now, have you always sort of worked in the wine business? I took a brief time off when I got my uh, culinary degree mm-hmm. and uh, worked. But again, back more or less in wine. I was with... Uh, with Hyatt for about six years on and off in food and beverage management. Okay. So I kind of stayed in there. I was a beverage buyer for a couple places and then okay. worked on the culinary side as well. So Okay. So um, you're working in the wine biz in the mm-hmm. 80s. And then I think you said you moved to Florida. Uh, we went – We let me see. Yes, I went into – we went to Hawaii and then we went to Florida. And then um, – I need uh, a map. Florida. Yeah, it's, we need it's a map big, and just like it's a pointer. Right, exactly. It's a green screen out Ex- here somewhere. Exactly. It's behind um, us. Yeah. So uh yeah, so then I went to from Florida, went to uh and I cooked in Florida for a little while and then I, I went to um then went to New York. And then after that I came back out, worked for Hyatt again for a period of time, and then I went to work for Southern Wines and Spirits for ten years. Okay. So why culinary school? I had worked with all these uh chefs in LA. Um, I wrote the first wine list for the first California Pizza Kitchen. I got to work with. Did you really? Uh, I got to do the. Uh, um, I got to work with. Um, oh, I just blanked on his name. He does Meals for Wheels, Meals on Wheels. Okay. Uh, Wolfgang Puck. So I worked with his people on the first Meals on Wheels, which took place at the back lot of Back to the Future. So I worked with them. So I got a chance to work with a lot of people, and I sat down with chefs, and I literally see them at 10 o'clock in the morning before anybody was in the restaurant, and they'd mm-hmm. be cooking, doing stuff, and try this. You know, t- okay, taste this. Write a wine list, add some things, so the, have coffee. and the then the cooking bug bit you a little so bit. So I like cooking. And then I'd always kind of liked it. I mean, you know, I was really – when I was a kid, I, I'm told. I don't remember this, but I used to make interesting sandwiches for my mom. Nice. Peanut butter and bologna and mm. popsicles and, mm. you know, cheese. Okay. So – um, I discovered peanut butter and bacon sandwiches when I was in That's middle good. school. That's good. Really good. Salty and yeah. It's, yeah, real, real good. Yeah. Um, so you go to culinary school in New York. Yeah. Which culinary school? CIA. Okay. Culinary Institute. The, the pop, the famous one. The guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was that like? It was good. It was intense. Um, you know, I did that, and at the same time, I cooked in Connecticut. Um, so my schedule was just completely immersed in mm-hmm. in culinary arts. And so that was a lot of fun. Then there's aspects of that. CIA doesn't just teach you how to cook. They kind of, first of all, they kind of break you down. And they have take, to, they, right? They take you, yeah, it's like the military. They take yeah. away what you think you know, and then now they're going to tell you what you know. Mm. But they also have um, a restaurant development course and wine course. Mm. So then I got to be close to a gentleman, one of the gentlemen that was running that, was Michael Weiss, uh, the wine course. And we were kind of in touch for a while. And then, um, and so then I graduated and left and and like I say, what went to work for Hyatt, um, but uh, the school was was intense. I stayed more on the morning shifts because there's two sets of shifts. There's mm-hmm. morning and lunch, and then there's lunch and and, <clears throat> and dinner shifts. And you do front of the house and back of the house. Okay. Your, your class is split in two, so it, you're in that that one of the four or five restaurants that they have on campus. You're in that either front of the house, back of the house at all time. They have 16 full kitchens on the campus, wow. so about 70 students broken into two groups. What um, was the hardest part? culinary school oh all of it i think the tests mm-hmm. the because te- you do practical exams you sit there and you cook for a certified master chef Ugh. butt clench yeah you just yeah. i mean you're just like okay no no pressure it's fine yeah but uh you know what doesn't kill you exactly so do you want to work in a restaurant or do you just do this because it's going to enhance what you already know I never want to work in the restaurant at a business at all. I never wanted. I didn't really want to be a chef. I just wanted to know how to cook, so I knew what they were doing, so that I would know how I could best interact with them. Wow, that's them. smart. So, and it does work. I mean, we things like the dinner we did mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know what they go through in the back of the yeah. house because you've you've done that. It's the same, not the same, but it's very similar with my reporters. I tell them all the time, I'm never going to have you do something that I wouldn't be willing to do myself do because so. I've done all of this right. stuff. So I know I know the stress that it takes. So I'm not going to I'm not going to put you into something that's going to completely break you down. Right. Um, but yeah, it's important to you. I think and that's in all aspects of the job. You've got to work. You got to be a line cook. You have to be the person who takes out the trash. You have to be the person who yeah. serves up the chips for the, I don't know. I mean, you have to do all those jobs all so then yeah. you know what it's like. And that's that's the same way I've, I found in the business when, when I finally decided to do Parkhurst. Um, it, it was because I had done pretty much everything else in, the, yeah. in every aspect of the business. So I had done this for you know two other people where I'd done brand development for them and launching brands and getting them started in the marketplace and helping them find their way. And... Um, I just thought to myself, I, I, I need to do this for me now. Cool. So very cool. How it... So you graduate culinary school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then what? Uh, California, look for a job. I'm in California, Seattle, look for a job. Marketplace is just horrible. So I got a beverage manager job at Hyatt again. This is the ho hotel yeah. group. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've worked at three of them, four of them. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty big company. Yeah, at the time they had 115 properties, but they only owned three. They're a management company. Oh, so okay. One that I worked at was one of the ones that they owned. So you're ordering wine for the restaurant? Doing wine, change, the hotel? Okay. Change, the, change that. We were the first. Uh, so they have core list, which is the, what the corporate suggestions are that you mm -hmm. carry so that there's some continuity in all the properties. We were the first uh, property to go off of core, so I got to write my own list, Ooh. which is cool. So but you'd already awesome. sort of done that before. Mm -hmm. You wrote the you said they wrote, wrote the first wine list for California Pizza CBK, Kitchen. Right? Who owns that? I have no idea. Yeah. It's a big company now. I, I it's like what huge they do now. But, but uh, yeah, this we were it was downtown Beverly Hills. It was cool. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it was cool. I'm just thinking about all of these things that you're telling me, and there's more. We're gonna get into more. But like, this is the resume of your life. Do you ever look back and go, I did a lot of stuff. Yeah, you do. You take stock. I think when when I find my when I found myself you know a few years ago just really having done what I, what I do. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know, really, what am I, what do I want to do? I consulted for a little bit with some people and for some companies, people that wanted to start wineries and start distribution companies and kind of told them how to set up their things. Um, but I really didn't know until um, my girlfriend brought me up here and introduced me to Rogue Valley. And then I was sitting literally on Danson's porch and said, I think I need to do this here. Yeah. So that's kind of how that went. Danson has that effect on you, on anyone. It's an inspirational place. I think I sit, I've sat on the deck yeah. before and said, I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the literally sitting on the deck and drinking wine. That's I can do this every day. Why not? Oh, I love it. That's good. Dan, that's a shout out for you. Yes, Dan. He's, he listens to some of these. So. Good. He's um, a good guy. He's a, oh gosh, yeah, he's, he's the guy. best guy. Yeah. He's just the best guy. Uh, so let's get back on track here. You're writing okay. a wine list for Hyatt. Does it feel kind of like flexing your muscles a little bit? Like, yeah, I'm writing this list, and this is all me. It it, it does, you know, but you you get thrown this bone, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. You think you can do this, make don't this work. Don't screw up. Yeah, don't screw up. Mm -hmm. Get your beverage cost down. Get all this. Get the variety. Mm -hmm. Make sure people aren't upset. And, yeah. You know, so... I had a lot of distributors, people that I went to work for later, upset that I had changed the list so much because they lost a lot of their placements. So. Oh. <laughs> that was interesting. Uh, how long are you with Hyatt? This is the uh, second time you're with this, Hyatt, right? This is actually the third time. Okay. Uh, I was with them on my externship from CIA. I cooked for them. Mm -hmm. That was crazy. We did – that was crazy. We did 10,000 covers a day for a two-week period of time during this tennis tournament in Palm Springs. Whoa! Was Where was crazy. this? It was in a hotel. Indian Wells. Indian Wells. Uh, the Grand Champions. High Grand Champions in okay. Indian Wells. So you're in the kitchen. Yeah, I was a uh, uh, what they call a turnout. So uh, you, I was a turnout and I was associate for the property. So I was either making every base liquid, base stock, base soup, base liquid, mm -hmm. um, or. When I'd show up at work, they'd tell me where I was going to go. So we had six major outlets, food at, food and beverage outlets in the in the property, and I could be grilling hot dogs or making some really nice fine dining food or 10, making 10,000 covers a day for a two day? weeks. That was for a two-week tennis tournament. So for the – I'd actually just learned this term, cover. This is basically a meal. A meal. A meal. And so we're talking 10,000 meals a day. Yeah. That is a buttload yeah. of covers. We were cranking food out. Big time for two weeks. For two weeks solid for the two tournaments. Dude. One was sponsored by the Checo Pasta, the other was Newsweek magazine. At the wow. Time. So they had that's men's a lot. week and a women's week. 
That's a that's a lot of sweat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of dirty yeah, chef's jackets. <laughs> yeah, it's like whoa for sure. <laughs> um, and so you, what what year is this? What are we talking? Is this late eighties? That was uh, no, that was in uh, that was uh, early nineties because I had we had come back from Hawaii after we were there for a little brief brief period. Niki, so this is 93, 94. Okay. Right I think I graduated in 94. I lost From track. culinary school? Yeah. I've okay. killed a lot of brain cells since right. then, so I don't. So you're working for Hyatt. How long the third time you work for them is how long? Uh, a couple years. Okay. A couple years, and then I, I got picked up by Southern. By Southern? Southern, Southern, Southern Wines and Spirits. Okay. And th- tell me what that is. So largest wholesale wine distributor in the world. In the uh, they're world. They're now called Southern Glazers. I think they're in 39, 40 markets at the time. They were in 15. So uh, I went in as an allocations person because a lot of the wines were limited in quantity but really in demand, so we'd have to portion out literally down to the bottle as to who got what. And then um, my boss left, and so I became the uh, director of marketing for the premium division, which is known as American Wines and Spirits, for a period of 10 years. And I stayed in that position for 10 years. Okay. And that's when my son came along. What are you doing for them? Um, Inventory management. Pricing and margin management. Mm-hmm. So I had about just about 9,000 SKUs in my book, my part of the book. And wow. there was two other people doing similar things for other parts of the company. 9,000 SKUs meaning little. That's a SKU. Yes. Yeah. And then. An item. One an I- item. One item. Mm-hmm. So inventory management, um, allocation management, uh, in-house marketing to make sure that uh, they were all staying competitive from a price standpoint. Okay. And um, I'm trying to think what else. Margin management, that, allocations. That was enough. And then your kiddo came along. Yeah. And changed everything? No, not okay. so much. Okay. But uh, his mom and I didn't last too much longer after that. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I moved away and started working and managing a couple of vineyards and wineries for some people that I knew out in the East Bay, in the Bay okay. Area. So this is a new thing for you, mm-hmm. managing um, a vineyard. An actual vineyard and production and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, the making, it's the easy part. That is the really easy part. From a physical standpoint, it's hard, mm-hmm. but when you get that versus selling or marketing or developing a brand, those are the tough things to do. Really? Yeah, they're hard. Okay. It's the hardest part of the business. So at this point, do you know this is what you want to do in life? Pretty much. I, okay. I started getting my feet dirty mm-hmm. in, out in the vineyard, and I really like that. What, is, what does it mean to manage a vineyard? Are you in charge of – You're just you're, – you're looking at – you're looking at where you – where what you need to have at the end of the day. When, what's in the bottle? How do we get there? Okay. So I was out there literally pruning with – I mean, I've done it. But we had a vineyard manager, but he had to have supervision, and that had to have somebody who had an eye on what the product was going needed to be like at the end of the mm-hmm. day, uh, where it needed to fit from a, a pricing standpoint, which is all about budget and how much do we need to put into the into uh, you know the vineyard itself in terms of how many times we have laborers pass through it, how many mm-hmm. times we drop fruit, how much do we drop fr- – those kinds of things. So um, – that was the first two times that I did that and really helped launch a brand and then um, get it established in the local market and then just try and stretch it. So we were up to – on both those brands, I had gotten up to um, about 11 states, 11 markets in two years. Wow. So it was pretty good. Yeah. Pretty strong growth. That's real good. Yeah. What does it mean to create a brand? So this is a wine where you need to figure out – I don't want to call it a scheme – but it's like a game plan of how a scheme. is it a scheme? <laughs> it's a, I mean, you have to. You have to. How you're going to get this in people's homes, period, right, period. and have them fall in love with it to the point mm-hmm. where they're either a wine club member, they're buying it at the store every time, right? They're, right, or picking it up at every restaurant, or it's by the glass in certain places. And, and the competition just, is insane. Insane, especially in California. I mean, uh, the people that I worked, the people that I worked for, uh, had day jobs of their own, and they also thought the wine business was romantic, and so they decided to start these wineries. So they put me in charge of doing that. So I would go back to them and we'd talk about where we were performance-wise and, and where we were in the market, and, and they're like, I said, look, you're a roofer. I said, how many, how many, uh, how many competitors do you have within a 50-mile radius? Mm-hmm. And it's oh, eight. I said, I have 1,000. Yeah. I mean, 1,000. So it was very competitive. And um, so a little bit of dog-eat-dog, and you have to – do you want to be in a dish- – distributor? Do you want to self-distribute? You know, those kinds of things. So when you're putting the brand together, you, it's really important to have a story, which I think we have here. And there has to be a reason for it. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to make? What's the voice? What's the expression? What's the theme? And uh, how is that expressed through packaging and pricing, um, your your position in the market, you know, your uh, your PR? 
There has to be a why. Yeah, it has to be a why. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, that, and that goes with everything. Why yeah. are you Why are you charging this for a white wine and this for this for red the, wine? For the red wine, right? Yeah. And how does it fit in uh, pricing wise in your portfolio? Because it's really important to have pricing in the existing portfolio that you're in that makes sense. You don't have these monumental jumps in price. Mm -hmm. You're know, like, well, this is twenty dollars, but this is eighty five. That makes mm -hmm. you know, it's hard. So, and then you have to be able to see where you fit uh, in the market. So, out of all those components, what do you find really takes it to the next level, getting it into a different state and then another state? Is it the story? Is it the wine, the, the product itself? When, when you're talking about getting into other states, I think in this day and age you're talking about is there buzz on the product? So that can come from mm. things like Wine Spectator magazine, mm -hmm. things like this, um, mm -hmm. where you're creating some interest in that state. Um, sometimes one of the things we used to do is we would enter competitions in that state so that it would have relevance. The wine would have relevance if it okay. won awards. So that gave us a reason. Then mm -hmm. we'd shoot a news story out into that state, create some interest through Google or advertising and things Dude, like that. that's a lot. So it's it's a lot, but, but you know, that's how you can do it. And so we would create interest. And then we had distributor relationships that we had formed, mm -hmm. and they would jump into different states too. Because once you have one of those, it's easier to have more. So if like, I own a wine shop, for instance, and I come to a tasting room that you're managing, the whole idea is that you want me to buy wine to put in my wine shop. No? Or yes? Yeah. I have a different philosophy for Parkhurst. At, but the two other brands were much more retail-driven, so it was always price and quality. Okay. That, that, so that was, the, that was the story with the other two brands. Um, I want to give price and quality here, but the focus is different. It's more elevated. So... What I did with those other brands was find a way to give a couple of horses in the race out of like 12 or 16 SKUs that were being produced that could work really well in the restaurant. So I, I knew I'd walk in and I could beat everybody on price and quality mm. because of those two SKUs. And you kind of make it up in the in what you call the roll-up of the entire portfolio. What's mm -hmm. it doing? So you have these that are elevated in price and these that are work horses but still the same quality. Mm -hmm. So that's one approach, and that's how I got into other states was just mm -hmm. good quality. Um, my approach with Parkhurst is different. We're uh, primarily what you'd call an on-premise brand, whereas we're not in much retail. We only, we're only in Harry and David, and that's fine with me. So, um, And that's probably all we'll be in in the area mm -hmm. as far as retail goes, and not everything that we make. Why is that, there. to make it more exclusive? A little bit more exclusive. First of all, we don't make a whole lot. You know, everything we do is about four barrels, which is 100 cases, mm -hmm. maybe double that on occasion. Um, but it is to create more of a direct-to-consumer relationship in terms of the selling process. Mm. Wine clubs and things like that. I've I've had to look at what we make and say, okay, here's how many wine club members I can have. It's a it's a finite number because I only have so much wine that I sure. want to continue to make. So um, and, th and you and don't want to make it so so exclusive that if someone's not in the wine club, they can't ever they get can't their hands it. on it. Although I'm like I'm a member of Kistler's Wine Club. I I don't buy everything from Kistler, but they're exclusively wine club and specific restaurants and. That's it. And they are very exclusive. It's a, here's right. your release letter. You get four bottles of this, three bottles of this. But that's their that. thing, right? That's their thing. So I don't want to get to that point. I just want to have it so that we can have it. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Here's your, here's, your, here's your club shipment. Here's the taste room. Bring some people down if you yeah. want. And then that's about all we do. And I found that's... And restaurants, excuse me. Yeah. Well. And I found that's, um, that's very typical with lots of winery owners and winemakers. They, they just want to find their niche. Right. For some, it means we want it everywhere as much as we can get it out there right. some say just wine club and tasting room people maybe a few grocery stores that's it that's it so everybody kind of, it seems like everybody has their their path or their vision of yeah. like, this is where yeah. i want my mm -hmm. wine mm -hmm. yep. and and a lot of it seems to you have to at some point um make sure there's control over this i guess i think i think you're building in control when you do that yeah you're building control into the brand because yeah. i don't I rarely have a conversation with anybody about my pricing because I don't have to. Mm. You sometimes, if you get good, in, yeah, <laughs> you get you get into conversations sometimes with retailers who will just blow out what you've got. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to that as opposed to which market you're doing business in. Oregon's very different than California. Yeah, it's very different than Texas. So, um, so it just depends on the market. And so you have to kind of handle your pricing with some kind of reverse uh, reverse technology where you. you Here's what I want it to be. So how do I get there and have it work for this state and this state and this state and this state? So it's different then. It's going to be mm -hmm. different. And then it seems like, to building a brand and expanding the distribution, mm -hmm. That's there's so many different steps. Right, there are. Lots of different steps. 
plus the legal ones, which mm -hmm. make it even more complicated. Yeah. yeah. So how long did you do that for these for these wineries? Um, you said East uh, Bay area. Yeah. So two and three, six years. Okay. Combined. So you're getting gaining a ton of knowledge and experience from this. Yeah, okay. and in a lot of different areas too, like the vineyard stuff and mm -hmm. production, which mm -hmm. I hadn't been that much exposed to in the past. Okay. So uh, what's after that? Uh, after that, uh, I started, well, at the last winery, I was, uh, I w it was sold to a Chinese firm and I was running that winery and I had hired. What winery was that? That was called Hannah Nicole. Okay. And, uh, that's in Brentwood okay. and the Northern California Brentwood, not the Southern California Brentwood. Gotcha. And, uh, <laughs> so and was that was. it sold to a Chinese firm? Yes. And okay. so, um, I had to hire some new staff. And I hired a, um, a lady named Angie, mm -hmm. and she I didn't know she was from up here, but she was from up here, and we got okay. to know each other, and we got close, and then she said, have you ever heard of the Rogue Valley? And I go, no, I haven't. She goes, you call yourself a wine person? And I go, well. Mm. She goes. Angie, boom. Boom. And so uh, she said, well, I'll show it to you, because that's where I was born and You call and yourself raised. a wine person, you and you haven't know. heard of the Rogue Valley. You don't even know. It's only five hours away. Thank you, Angie. Right. Setting him straight. That's right. That's right. So anyway, so she brought me up here, and. We started rambling around. She's got a lot of friends in the industry. And when a lot when of was this? Over. So it's about six years ago. Okay. Oh, and, and that's, that's so, good. That was so a good time. Her, yeah, and her. I guess uh, her high school reunion was it was the first event they did at Dancing. I guess when after they had opened. So okay. that so she took me there. She took me to Red Lily and mm -hmm. and all these other places. And I really was. I think Rosal had just opened too. Mm -hmm. So really, kind of going. Wow, I really like this. This so is cool up here. So you did you go to Rosal? Oh yeah, we went. We we hit everywhere. I mean, you went. So you're going to some fantastic spots in Southern Oregon, and then back home, and then back up like two months later. I mean, we we're just back and forth a lot, okay. a lot. And you know, she has family up here and stuff sure. like that. So, so she was down there working. She was down there working okay. and living. Okay. She has her kids. Right. And so you guys, you're doing this bounce back and forth. What What do you notice as far as I don't want to compare, but what do you notice are the differences in Southern Oregon from where you guys were? Oh, oh, at that time, at that time, uh, just pace of life and everything. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, detoxifying to come up here. You know, mm. you just <sighs> breathe good. and, and I like the area. I mean, geographically, I liked, I liked the diversity of the Valley and, uh, especially for producing wine. That was great. And that mm. also lent itself to other things that were really interesting, you know, like, you know, rogue creamery and the chocolate mm -hmm. i mean you know all these all things, the things all that make it really unique and um so that's what i really appreciated it in the bay area you've got the variety you've got those unique things but they all come with a steep steep price tag yeah in a lot of different ways um dealing with the restaurant people in the B bay area is you know these people they're pretty demanding yeah i so. love i absolutely love the bay area but i just find that it's a little extra mm-hmm the traffic. Oh, traffic's gotten horrible. The pricing. Everything. Yeah. Just, I mean, it's, it's a little extra. For those zip codes, it's a lot of money. I know. It's a lot of money. I was I was going to brunch on Sunday, and there was an accident on Interstate 5 where it literally came to a standstill. This and last Sunday? Yeah. Yeah, I was. Did you get stuck in that seat? I did. I peeled off. Okay. I, I was so annoyed. Yeah. I was so annoyed. And I'm like, what is this? And I think I was literally stuck in traffic maybe 10 minutes so not even an hour. And I was so irritated that I was stuck in traffic because of an accident. And I texted my husband. Um, yes, I was in the car, but I was stopped. But I texted yes, you're my stopped, husband. So you're I did. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. And I was like, I'm spoiled, spoiled rotten, because we just don't have traffic here. It's just not a thing. It's so funny because people would tell me, they go, well, where's your tasting room? And it's like, oh, that's in talent. Where do you live? Center point. They go, oh, that's a drive. And I'm going, are you kidding me? Oh, your commute. <laughs> oh, your it's horrible. It's, a, it's 15, the worst seven miles I've ever yeah, driven in my life. That 15 minute commute you have yeah. all the way to the tasting my, room. My girlfriend lives, she lives 11 miles away from her job. And sometimes it takes her over an hour to get there in the Bay Area. No. Yeah, no. No, but, thanks. Anyway. No, so she's, is she still there? Yeah, she's there and I'm here. Wait, what? Yeah. Not the most ideal situation. But, no. But, is she, uh, are there plans? Oh, we have plans. To get her up we have plans. here? She would, she would be here in a heartbeat. Okay. Put her kids in school, and she wants that to see that it, through. That and makes, it makes it tough. It, makes it tough. So she she's doing the right thing. She but, doesn't want her kids to go to 17. No, 17 grade schools. schools. So they'll turn out like Mark, and we do not want that. <laughs> so how many kids does she have? She has two. One's an, one's an adult, and okay. she has another one's uh, 14. Oh, you guys are so close. Yeah, we're so close. So close. Yeah. So but we, that's really sweet, because I do feel like... 
there is a sacrifice that comes into play when you have kiddos. Yeah. And especially when you want to keep them in a school or keep them in a location. In a community and their friends and all that. And I get that. And there, I think that's a good thing. Absolutely. So, so. There, there's a sacrifice that comes with that. I didn't realize you, you guys were doing the long distance thing. Yeah, we go back and forth. Back How and forth, long have you been dating? Uh, six-ish years. Okay. We won't hold you to it. It's fine. It's no, fine. I, I have the dates. It's just... It's, it's about okay. six years. And you're on years. the spot, too, and there's yeah. a big old microphone in front of your face. Um, so she's still working at a winery? No, she doesn't. She uh, is in the insurance business. Oh, okay. So she got out of that. She got out of that. That's, okay. Yeah. But obviously, the ownership was a little still, wonky. <laughs> still a lover of wine, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very much so. Awesome. And what's her name? Angie. Angie. Yeah. We need to get Angie up here. That's who I said hi to on, on my on the oh, video. Oh, that's right. I remember yeah. now. Yeah, at the wine dinner. She said, wasn't there. Yeah, she said made her cry. Yeah, and we turned around and said hi to her. Yeah, and on... I filmed it, and I sent it off to her. So that's And she's from here. She's from here. Yeah, so went to school here and everything. Lots of family and friends. Lots of family and friends. Okay. Yeah, her, 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 mom and her mom has a house over in Grants Pass. All her friends live in the area here. One of her girlfriends cuts my hair. I love know. it. Yeah. I love it. Southern Oregon. Okay, we got way off track. Yeah, sorry. Uh, what were we talking about? We were talking about Parkhurst. And the story. Okay, so you um, you guys are kind of bouncing up ba- back and forth. And that has a lot to do with the story. Does it? Yeah. Okay, well, tell me. Okay, so we were bouncing back and forth, and I decided to do this. So we started um, – um, I started a conversation with, uh, with um, uh, Chris Graves at Nama's – crush and he's a winemaker there don't you just love him yeah he's a great guy he's a great, he's a great guy. guy hi chris yes hi chris and uh and the staff and that's where my son works actually on the on the cellar staff there really yeah I so it's kind of cool um so anyways we got in a conversation with him he started producing wine for us with the 15 pinot and the 16 chardonnay us being us being parkhurst, parkhurst. i didn't have a name i didn't have I had kind of a but concept you're, but you're like, it wasn't I, there i want to make wine in so Southern let's Oregon. do this yes so okay. let's do this and let's start with the obvious stuff pinot and chard Okay. So we started with that, and we were going back and forth and going back and forth. And I'm like, how do these people do this in the Old West? This is insane. And I was just really thinking about that. And I said, we've got to find a name for this place. And I said, well, what are some of the Western personalities and people? I wanted something that was historical but contemporary. Uh-huh. I didn't want my name on the bottle. Okay. And um, so I found this story about um, One-Eyed Charlie Parkhurst. One-Eyed Charlie, Charlie Parkhurst. Parkhurst, who was a six-horse wagon whip for the California Oregon stage line. Whoa. So I'm starting to read some of the stories. because not a lot of history, but, you know, mm-hmm. um, I mean, some things. Like, you're, like, Googling. I'm Googling this, and I'm looking at every link I can and mm-hmm. spending days doing this. And, and um, was really recognized as the best six-horse wagon whip. Uh, eventually uh, retired, moved back to Salinas, and where the tombstone, the plaque is. Mm-hmm. And uh, passed away, was doing agricultural business, passed away. Coroner comes to collect the body. They find out that Charlie Parkhurst is actually Charlotte Parkhurst, was a woman. Was a woman, but mm-hmm. she was dressing as a man. Yeah, she lived as a man. Lived as a man. Because that's the job she wanted to do. Her entire life. So she did what she had to do. God, I love her. So she did what she had to do to survive, and she did what she loved. And I thought, okay, I, I can relate to all that. We're making this trip back and forth. And I'm like, we're making this trip back and forth. She made this trip back and forth. All these things seem to resonate. Mm-hmm. Um, she ran, a, twice she ran an entire stage of gold to New York from California for Wells Fargo. So that's why we put the Wells Fargo original type font in this gold. This is the Wells Fargo original, original type font. In gold. In gold. So that's why we use that. Very deliberate. We used a, a Western era, 1850s uh, vintage lace that we got the lace and we had it vectored so that we could print it and use it as our, our lace. And we used purple because Angie likes purple. Nice. And there's no other purple in the market. No. So. You did your research. Mm-hmm. Take the bottle, put it on the shelf. Go to Harry and David, put it on the shelf. <laughs> Literally, move it here, put it on there. Okay, it sticks no out. No other purple. Yeah. So, wow. So that's the reason why, and that's that's the uh, that was the inspiration for the name. I just love the story, and I thought it was something contemporary, uh, just because she did what she wanted to do and what she had to do. She actually voted in presidential election in eighteen fifty something, fifty three. As a dude. Yeah, but she was the first woman that voted. So interesting stuff. So it was a great story, and uh, she loved children. She's carried saltwater taffy in her pockets and handed out killed a guy for trying to rob the stage um he had successfully robbed the stage i think six months earlier and so she started carrying a shotgun and they she, pulled the road and she bam uh-huh. didn't even think she killed, a guy. <laughs> she killed a guy she killed a guy um and didn't you say also she i don't know what to call her she 
Charlie. It depends on what part of the story I'm telling. I'll either say her or him. Okay. It kind of fluctuates back and forth. Do you know how she lost her eye? It was kicked out by a horse. She was uh, she was put in an orphanage with her brother. There's some of this is conjecture that, that people are like. I sure. think we think this is what happened. There was three three children in the marriage. One passed away, so the the parents divorced, and they put the children in an orphanage. Mm-hmm. Her and her brother. Her brother was killed. She ran away in his clothing. Went to went from Pennsylvania to Rhode Island, and then met somebody who does basically blacksmithing and horse training and things like that, mm-hmm. and uh, got her eye kicked out by a horse. Wow. I wonder. I wonder if the motivation of where, like, she's in her brother's clothes, and I wonder if it was because she really wanted to be a man, or if she was smart and realized I can get further if people think, I think I'm a dude. I think she felt safer. Felt yeah. safer. Felt safer. Because she traveled on foot, and however she got to where she went, she went from Pennsylvania to Rhode Island, and then she made her way west to California, somehow. And this is a job. She this was her job, mm-hmm. right? It's her job. Did you say she was like moving bootlegs too? Like, no, no? I don't know much about that. I just know okay. that she was just, you know, she was running the busiest stage line at the time, one of the busiest ones at the time. And the whole idea is you've got this precious cargo, and so you have to get to where you're going super fast because you can get robbed. You can get robbed, yeah. So and six horses. Six horses, nine people on the stage, nine nine uh, commuters <laughs> on the stage plus a shotgun. Mm. She's a badass. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was the actual quote in some of the articles. Really? The original badass. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's so, amazing. Yeah. What a cool story. It is a cool story. And sometimes if you, if you watch old Westerns, there'll be a stagecoach handler that has a patch. And, and that's a reference to Charlie. One-Eyed Charlie. That's Charlie Parker. And then the last stop in Oregon was um, the Two-Bit Tavern, which is now the Willow Creek Tavern. No way. So they, yeah, it built on top of that site. Okay. Yeah. So, is there some history within there? Well, they show they, when you go see the the pictures and things that they have in the diagrams out in the front. Um, they have a picture of stagecoach it being a stagecoach stop, and it was that was the end of the line for her. And then she go back to Salinas. So there's a plaque in Salinas for her. When you found this story, were you just like, "That's it. This is it." Yeah, I said, "This is it." And to me, it just you find the story, you're like, "Oh my gosh, this is absolutely perfect." You're doing all of the research. It's just making so much sense to you. It's just meant to be. It felt very much like that. I mean, once we started the ball rolling from a production standpoint and then getting our LLC and then getting our federal license and getting all the things that you have to go through, mm-hmm. it's just one thing kept leading to another. And it's just like, this is moving rather quickly. And that's kind of why I'm here and she's still down there. Mm-hmm. I never anticipated just it would happen that quickly. Okay. But, uh, but it did. And uh, so we've had some good early success, you know, medals and things like that and recognition. We got mm-hmm. some nice pri- press and write-ups and things. And so that kind of moved it along as well. And then we want to give more variety and we want a tasting room and, you know, yeah. one thing leads to another. There's that buzz, right? Yeah. You're creating that buzz. Yeah, create the buzz. Um, you said you started with Chris originally. Is he still making your wines? Yeah. Okay. And where did the grapes come from, the, that all, was first? All came from, uh, all are Rogue Valley exclusively. Um some of the first stuff, the first Pinot and Chardonnay came from the Namas family vineyards, which okay. we use. Uh, and we're starting to source from about five total vineyards right now. And Chris is making it from their crush facility. Yes, at, at okay. Namas Crush and Fermentation. But there is a Parkhurst tasting room. There is in talent. In talent. Mm-hmm. So what are you making right now? Production-wise, let's see. Our last bottling, we added a, uh, a Red Meritage, which is Bordeaux blend, mm-hmm. all five diff- different grapes. Uh, Merlot, uh, Rosé of Grenache or Grenache Rosé, however you want to say it, and uh, a Brut Rosé, so sparkling wine, we'll have that for the summer. Oh, you had me at Bubbles. It's really good. It's really, really good, too. That's, that, is my, that is my beverage of choice, yeah. Bubbles. And then uh, we finished, uh, we bottled up our 18 Pinot and our 18 Chard, mm-hmm. and our 18 Pinot is going to be in the barrel auction at uh, OWE. Yay! So we did that this year, okay. which you is cool. Okay, you said Pinot? Yeah. Okay. 18. So this oh. is 17. Really quickly, we have to say, uh, barrel auction for Oregon Wine Experience. Mm-hmm. It's the founders barrel auction, kind of a, a nod to the three founders that sort of, that not sort of, they started World of Wine. Mm-hmm. Um, Asante took over and created Oregon Wine Experience and turned it into a fundraiser. 100% of the proceeds go to Children's Miracle Network. Right. Um, on the Friday of the event, winemakers from across the state come and essentially you're donating wine. Right. So we taste this wine and then you auction off whatever, cases. Cases. The whole barrel. Some people we, buy the entire barrel. We did. Uh, we devoted 10 cases of production. Okay. And um, we were given the option to um, um, 
to specifically focus the uh, the donation, the proceeds from the donation for our wine mm -hmm. to the new cancer um, uh, Beautiful. building that they're building, the Beautiful. cancer center that they're building. So, so that was really good. And Very why was that? that? Why did um, I survived cancer uh, six years ago or five years ago? Did you really? Yeah, and so um, means a lot. Yeah. What kind of cancer? Colon. Colon cancer. Yeah. Where was it scary? Yeah, you don't know. That's probably a stupid question. You don't know, and you know, there's the the healing process is fairly invasive. Mm -hmm. The operation's invasive. Everything you know, everything about it. Everything is after is is really. My mom had breast cancer, yeah. and everything that came after was horrendous. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations. Yeah, so, but uh, had a lot of love in my life at the time, so that. So that, that pl definitely hits you, hits home for yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, amazing. And so you guys are going to be back at the auction yep. on Friday. And it's just the best of both worlds. You're going through and tasting these incredible wines that are unique and specific. Can't really find them anywhere else. Right. And then you get to be obnoxious and competitive. and <laughs> Right? Right. We and, try to deal that card from the bottom of the deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, you, you get to – and you get to see your, your, your wine in, in, its, in its atmosphere, in its competitive atmosphere. You know, where do, where do you fit in? Mm -hmm. And have some amazing food. Hang out with some really cool people, and uh, it's a it's a great week. I mean, this will be our third year um, of participating, but it'll be the fourth year that I attend. So, okay. When I went the first year, it was just like this is cool. I have to be a right? part of it. Yeah, I know. So it's I want to make wine just to be in this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's the same. It's like yeah, I I go to that event every year, and I just think. I I need to get in the wine business. This is just too much fun. That's what attracts people. That's why it's thought as being so romantic right. and everything. Is That's why you that. sit on the deck at dancing and go. And go I think I, I can do it. this. Yeah. Ugh. Easy. I can make pizzas. I can't, yeah. Dan. I can't do any of it. That's why I go to dancing. Um, well, that's amazing, and I'm really excited for Parkhurst. Thank you. What a beautiful story. Thank you. We just Thank need you. to get that girl of yours up here. Yeah, that'll happen. That'll happen. It will. Yeah. It will. And is she excited to work with you on this, or does she she's, want to do something completely different? No, no, no. No, she's, she's, she's like, got no, her heart in it. putting her to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, she's, she has probably been the, uh, the, the greatest brand ambassador I could ever have. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she's gotten introduced me to all kinds of people that she's nurtured relationships with up here mm. and uh it's it's meant a lot to me and that's really been the kind of the 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 portal the gateway whatever you want to call it to coming up here that has helped make things so, so successful yeah. it's because she's out there plugging away pitching away doing things you should do this on facebook you should do this try this why don't you meet these it's people yeah you know, it's a good person i mean you found you found love and passion all in all kind of at the same time all at the same time yeah that's that's luck that's cool. man yeah Lots of luck. You know, I my love. mom used to say, you, you just put yourself in the path of success. It'll hit you. Mm -hmm. So, And that's what you do. You know, you open your heart and your mind to things and say, okay, what and are really And take risks, want? right? Yeah, you have to. You have to do that. I'm not good at that. I was just thinking about that this morning. I'm a horrible risk taker. Well, I think it comes at different times for everybody. I think, you know, I, I do believe a little bit in luck, but I think luck is that, you know, you've got experience and an opportunity and mm -hmm. they don't always come at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I I wasn't sitting on Dan's patio 15 years ago. I was sitting on it six years ago, mm -hmm. and that's when it hit me. And that's out of necessity because I had to do what I had to do. I was, I'd run my I'd run my game in the wine business. I'd done everything that I could do unless I wanted to do something all over again mm -hmm. or take huge steps backwards. I didn't want to do that. Yeah, the only I thing do, I hadn't done was the ownership. I, and I do feel like that's a that I find that a lot too. Where if you would have done this 15 years ago. It wouldn't have worked. Yeah, probably not as good. Yeah. Yes, but it happened six years ago because that's when it was supposed to happen. I do believe in that yeah. a ton. Yeah. And it's just it happens when it's supposed to happen yeah. for you, and you make that decision. You go, you go to the right instead of the left. To the because, left, and that's that's then that's your path. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, we're gonna wrap up a little bit, but okay. I do have a wine question for you. Okay. Markups in restaurants. Mm -hmm. How how much is wine marked up in most restaurants? It depends on the caliber of the restaurant. Okay. Okay. Some places are really reasonable. They want to stick to a formula that um, is only a certain percentage over retail. Um, <clears throat> so if you had a retail price, this this particular one's forty five. So in a restaurant, this would, in a restaurant that was had a kind of a nominal philosophy of that, that would probably come in in the sixty range. Um, but okay. if you're in a finer restaurant, you might get either two to two and a half times retail. Mm. 
Ouch. Can be. You know, it depends, again, depends on the restaurant, depends on what depends on what kind of crystal they're using, depends on the level of service, what's the caliber, how much inventory are they carrying, how much does this have to pay for itself? What are we doing with it? Are we featuring it by the glass or are we featuring it um, um, just on the wine list by the bottle? Okay. So features by the glass, a good rule of thumb is they're probably acquiring the wine somewhere near the cost of what they're selling a glass for. Whoa. There's huge risk. Once you tap this, you got to get, get rid you gotta of it. You got to get rid of it. So if they cover that bottle cost, at least they didn't lose money on it. Does that happen a lot where you've opened a bottle of wine the night and then people have to go, and then it has to go bye-bye? It, it, it happens. There's means to preserve it, but it's, they're, they're not all yeah. ideal, you know, either gassing, which I don't like, or the, the just suck the air out of it with a little, um, I think it's called vacuum in or something like that. Mm -hmm. The newest technology is Corbin, and Corbin's where yes. they pop the needle through. And that does work. However, you have to make sure that your machine's working properly, and, and you know it doesn't work on screw caps. Right. doesn't work on champagne, obviously. Right. That would just blow the whole thing up. Right. Um, That's so, okay. I, I don't ever have any bubbles left yeah, over. Yeah, there's never leftover ever. champagne. Ever. And they do have a pretty good device for that because it does yeah. seal it down and keeps the bubbles inside. So um, so that's usually the rule of thumb on a, on a, um, on a by-the-glass situation. Okay. And then some people, you know, again, we get into a pricing conversation with Oregon because it's very different than California. In California, I can have a price for a restaurant. I can have two prices for a restaurant, wine by the, lit, by the glass, wine on the list price. Mm -hmm. I can have a price for Walgreens. I can have a price for Costco. I can have a price for Safeway. Mm -hmm. And I can have a price for Joe Retailer. And okay. so all those can be different because they all compete within themselves. Right. California doesn't interpret you competing against Costco or you competing against a restaurant. So Oregon what does, we do, though. Oregon does. Oregon does. So the same price has to go out to every wholesale oh. buyer. So you can't, I can't go to Costco, for instance, and find your wine for a cheaper price than I could somewhere else in Oregon? No, that's not how, well, it's different, oh. again, because Costco only does a certain percentage of markup versus other retailers. Mm -hmm. So they would technically have to be able to buy it for the same price as like a, a merchant in Ashland. Okay. Okay, so they have to, the same bottle price, but then because their markup is different, they charge less. Hmm. Now you get into issues about what's your what's the price of the product at Costco versus if you're a wine club member, and those are the conversations I never want to get into. So I don't. Yeah. That's why I'm not going to certain markets. So good for you. And that's also why I do business with uh, with Harry and David on a retail standpoint because their their procedures, their markup is is such that I can that that makes sense. Okay. And so, it protects the restaurants. Yeah. And so you essentially you want to have your wines at Harry and David. Mm -hmm. It's in the tasting room. Mm -hmm. And then in certain restaurants, mm -hmm. and that's it. That's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You're, that's your box. That's that's yeah. Okay. That's the box. Okay. Yeah. Hey, and everybody has their different box, right? Yeah, and I it mean, works it, for them. It works for them. It has to work for. It has you know, to work for you. Yeah. Yeah. And some people you know, get put into a situation where, you know, like, oh, we need to do something with this wine, and you know, they have an odd wine that they that they feel has been in inventory too long or whatever, and so they'll say, well, you know, Costco likes it. Let's give it to Costco. Well, that's fine. It, they're a great retailer, mm -hmm. but you have to do that next year, next year, and mm. next year, or you got to replace that volume somehow. Yeah. So financially, you have to figure out how that's going to fit in the long long term. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we were at a restaurant a couple of years ago in Las Vegas. Fantastic restaurant. I'll just give them a shout out. Not that anyone who works there is listening to this. <laughs> Cut in the Palazzo. Oh, in the Palazzo. It's okay. Wolfgang's. Wolfgang. Mm -hmm. um, he was actually just on. I don't know if you've ever seen the chef. The Chef Show or something on Netflix. It's with John Favreau, who was in oh, the yeah. Chef. Oh yeah, was the in movie. Chef. Yeah. And then they created this series of episodes after the fact, just cooking stuff, being in different kitchens. I haven't watched it. There was just an episode with him and Wolfgang. They're in cut, and he's showing him all these different. It's a steakhouse, right? All these different steaks and whatnot. Anywho, we go there anniversary dinner, um, and we're game to just spend money, what right? Because yeah. it's a it's a fine dining, very expensive restaurant. One of the best steaks I've ever had in my life. So if anyone's listening, Cut is an amazing restaurant. But their wine list, put that in quotes, is about this big. I think. It's literally a Bible. And we're going through, and I'm just like over, completely overwhelmed. This right. is the restaurant we were in that the wine bottles are like 2,000, 3,000. 8,000, 8,000. And we're just going, um, no, we're not yeah. going to do that. So. Our server was fantastic. Helped us find a bottle of wine. I think we may have paid 120 bucks for it or something. It was a restaurant a, like that. That's a yeah, good deal. It was a Barbera. It was delicious. But I just, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, is this really an $8,000 bottle of wine? How much was that marked up? 
Well, it depends on what it was. I mean, it, oh, I don't know. I didn't yeah. even. Know. I see eight thousand. I'm like, nope. Yeah, you're reading from the right column nope. left. Yeah. <laughs> so you're reading in reverse order. So a lot of people do, and 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 there's a lot of psychology to that too. Oh, I love right it. to left, and then where does it fit in on the page? Yeah, has a lot to do with it. So does you want to be in that below the top, but not upper third. Okay, because you've done this. Yeah. So there's a lot of psychology to it. Really? Yeah. And so then you want to make sure that that has, you know, stages that it goes up so you don't, so it doesn't stick out like it's stuck out with you. The whole point is for someone to buy those wines, though. At some point, and they probably only have one bottle. It's just, you know, you're doing that so that you have some, some, you know, the wine has just got some cachet, some buzz. It's an investment. Um, You know, they're probably on a a grand award winner for their wine list Mm -hmm. on Spectator. But that $8,000 bottle of wine could maybe go for $2,000? Couple grand, probably. Okay. Because it's got to sit there, and they got to make the investment, and and you know the people that are going to buy that are going to be, you know, some fairly well off people. That not are, Trish Glows, yeah, <laughs> not Mark Enlow. <laughs> um, I'll gladly open it for you. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know they'll, they'll probably it's probably a business expense, and yeah. it goes to all that. So. Well, I will say we did not we did not go crazy, but we got a gorgeous, and I think it, I want to say it was from Alba, which is Medford's sister city. I don't know oh. if you do that in Italy. So it was kind of special. I was like, oh, this bottle was meant to be for us. There you go. And the sommelier came over, and it was a big production, and the candle. Oh, they, they canned it for you. And, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you had some age on the bottle. I did. Mm-hmm. Good. See, those are values that you can find in pretty much any wine program. And there's some really amazing stuff. You go to a restaurant, and you're like, yeah, I'm going over to this page because I know that's where that's going to yep. be. Mm-hmm. You know. uh, the candle – I don't know. Has, has have you seen this before with the candle? Okay, this was my first experience with a sommelier, a legit sommelier opening a bottle of wine for us, and we had our ideas of what the candle was for. It's not what it's for. It was actually to see through the glass, through to the see glass. sediment as the sediment. sediment starts to approach the neck. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't. So you got to put it. You got to hold it like if that's the candle. You'd hold it like that so okay. you can see the light through it, and then slowly pour it into the decanter. And then as soon as you see that sediment, pull it back, set it down. Really? You've done this a few times. A couple hundred. A couple hundred times. So, yeah, I mean, it was this big production. You can even get a cradle to do it mechanically that has a candle in this little swivel thing. Really? Yeah, they're cool. He poured he poured a little bit in a glass, sniffed it, and put that over. And my first thought was like, man, I want that. Yeah. <laughs> put that it's, in my glass. Yeah. yeah. So they want to do that, make sure it's it's yeah. sound. I'm that, I'm that redneck from South Carolina <laughs> that's like, just give me the wine. Just I want, pour it. I just pour I said, it. pour it. I just want to drink it. <laughs> Uh, but no, it was an it was an amazing you experience. Ask for ice. <laughs> oh my gosh! But you know what? I'm hearing a lot from masters of wine right now. We have one in our state, uh, Tim Hanai, mm-hmm. who him. says if if you want ice in your wine, give them ice. Give them ice. Let's sell more wine. Yeah. Stop making it so. Do. Stop making it so. My like Grenache, I put a little chill on it in the summertime. It, it re- responds to it. See, I love a light red wine with a little chill a little on chill. it. I think it's amazing. Yep. Where, what, a decade ago, people would be like, oh, how dare you? So. I mean, if it's 90-some degrees out, I don't want to serve it at room temperature. Blech. That's horrible. I, I don't know. want red wine when it's 90 degrees yeah, out. Yeah, I'll I drink want... a red, but give me something that's lighter and got a little fruit and a little chill on it. And Amen. Uh, there's some sparkling red wines that are out there. I know that Australia uh, makes a sparkling Shiraz that's really cool. And that's a great summertime barbecue wine. There's uh, France that's real popular to do, like, sparkling Gamay. Mm-hmm. So those are cool. Lambrusco. Lambrusco. <laughs> My mom and dad used to drink cold duck. I was like, so I think about that, and I go, yeah, no. My, uh, she was, she was, she did weather. She was my co-anchor. She did weather when we were on the morning show. A lot of people remember her. Lindsay Matherly loved Lambrusco, Lambrusco. and I thought it was the most disgusting thing ever. But it's her. It's her. It's her jam. Yeah. But she has upgraded a little bit. So not that Lambrusco's a bad thing. But anyways, I feel like we could talk about wine all day. Sure. Yeah, we could. But <laughs> we could. we're not going to. We're not going to because we're going to get uh, – we're going to move on to the final three, Mark okay. Enloe. I prepped you on these. Yes, you did. Sometimes I forget, so I have to make sure I prep everybody. Best advice you've ever been given? Um, probably from my dad. Just do what makes you happy. Mm. Simple. Yeah. To the point. Yeah. It's the last thing he told me. Last thing he told you? Mm-hmm. Oh, when did so, he pass? Oh, it's been about, uh, let's see, my son was, my son was, I think, only two, so about mm. 20 some years ago. Mm. Last thing he told you? Yep, it was oh. the last thing he told me. That kind of hit me in the gut right there. Um, you And you're doing it. Yeah. You're following your dad's advice. Just doing what I'm told. Yeah. <laughs> 
Awesome. I try sometimes. Um, <laughs> I do have to preface this next question. You've been here a year. Yeah. So first of all, welcome to Southern Thank you. Oregon. Uh, we're happy to have you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they discover Parkhurst, they're going to also be happy that you're here. Uh, if you ever left this place, what would you miss about it in the year that you've been here? Uh, well, in the year that – see, I, I feel feel like it's been so much longer because of all the traveling up here. Oh, sure. And um, um, so the, the people – it's the people. Um, I made some really good friends up here in very short order. And I've been introduced to a lot of wonderful people, and I, I really value those friendships. I probably, if it was anything, it'd be the people. Mm. Yeah. yeah, good yeah. folks up here. Good folks. Uh, final meal, final drink. Oh, no. I know. It's a good one, right? It's tough. It's so tough. It's really, really tough. But you can have whatever you want, so it can be like eight million things. Yeah, well, it, it probably wouldn't be a big meal. Probably be something real simple that maybe took a long time mm. to cook. Um I know the wine would probably be a Bordeaux. I love that you're starting with wine first. Yeah, 59 Latour probably. Okay. So um, that would be the first choice. A 59? Chateau Latour. Okay, so that's very specific. Yeah, You've had for, this before. I did. Okay. It's really exceptional. Parker was his first, I think, 100-point wine that he rated. Whoa. I think. Um, so it would probably be the, that wine. If not, then a Burgundy. If it was a Burgundy, it would be a 78 Clos de Tar. From Mont Saint, so also very specific. Also I love very it. Specific. Um, uh, then for food, it'd be fairly simple. Um, I love foie gras, so I'd have to have some foie gras, mm. which would require a sauterne. So I'd have to have sauterne with that course, yeah, and then of course. probably something red meatish mm. fillet. Okay. Big porterhouse, something like that. Yeah. And then uh, finish it off with a good dessert that has something that flames. Something that's like, I need something on fire. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, something like that. Are so. you a sweet wine drinker, like a dessert wine guy? Um, I don't really drink sweet wine on a regular basis, but I love it when it's paired with the right thing. Yeah. So I love things like fresh fruit and Moscato d'Asti. It's really good. And, and uh, um, so I like that. I like, uh, I like Sauterne from Bordeaux. I like some of the late harvest Rieslings from Germany mm. and some of the things that um, – um, like Quadi does in California. Those are really oh my uh, Elysium and, and Essencia. Those were, I came into the industry when those things were just really, really? getting popular. So it was fun to experience those wines, those wines specifically. Those blew my mind. Yeah. And then I love port. I love vintage port. Mm -hmm. It's usually not a good sign that I'm deciding to have vintage port at that time of the night if I've made that decision right. that my decision making process is probably flawed. It's always, yeah, it's always it's like, that last drink, isn't let's it? Let's have a 55 Coburn. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Night's still young. Yeah, night's still young. It's only okay. a few hundred bucks. So. I love it. Um, it. Sorry, we've got we've got the door opening and closing. That's okay. We are in a studio where people are trying to get people ready for a newscast. Okay. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, tasting room and talent is open when? We are temporarily closed. For, temporarily closed. Yeah, temporarily closed because we're doing some stuff for the county, that's which okay. is in debate as to how much of it we have to do and we don't. So that's why it's taking so long. Ooh. Yeah. So, but uh, we're we're doing that, and as soon as that opens, which I would. It can be literally within a few weeks, a couple of weeks. We'll okay, be back in so people should look for you late March, early April. Yeah, as far as the tasting room, other than that, we're around town. We're ported in quite a few places. Obviously, the Rogue Grape probably carries more of our wines. Than, mm -hmm. than... Can people find you on Facebook? Absolutely. Okay, because I mean, that's where Parker's Wine Cellars and okay. got a huge following. A lot of the news that you know we put out there as far as tastings and events uh, goes out there first, mm -hmm. and uh, we tend to direct people to that. We also have a um, website. Okay, mm, so. so I would say if people want to go to the tasting room, they should probably keep track of your Facebook page because that's where it will be announced. That's where it will be announced, right. Okay, and Parkhurst then, Wine Cellars. Right. Okay. Parkhurstwines.com right. is the website. All so. right, we'll get this junk worked out with the county. Yeah, so. we're getting that taken care of. Okay. Um, I'm not even going to ask. Uh, <laughs> we, don't no. have an, we don't have a whole other morning. <laughs> Uh, I've it's heard, a laundry list. Uh huh. I've heard uh -huh. stories. I've heard stories. Well, if you're listening to this podcast on Apple's podcast app and you like it, please subscribe, rate, and review. It helps other people find us. We're also on Google Play, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. And you can watch the video portion at ktvl.com. We're also on YouTube. One more time, Mark and Lo, thanks for meeting Angie. Thanks yes. for moving to Southern Oregon. Thank you. And thanks for your contribution. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Privilege.